So situation normal, everything must change. Um, my name is Simon Wardley. I work for the Leading Edge Forum. I specialize in organizing uh, IT for the future. Now, I'm actually going to start this, this session with a bit of a story. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, researching into the Industrial Revolution. I was getting bogged down with various definitions of what the Industrial Revolution was. And I got into a taxi, and I asked the taxi driver what he thought, and he said, it's like mechanized horses in it. And that was brilliant. Um, a few years later, I was doing some research on cloud computing, and again, getting bogged down in definitions. So I got in a taxi, and I asked a taxi driver, and he said, cloud, well, it's like computers on the internet, in it. And I thought, marvelous, fabulous. So when Ed and Alistair asked me to talk about big data, first thing I did was jump in a taxi, and I asked the taxi driver what he thought, and he said, well, the key to big data is all about managing and sensing a great disturbance in the flow. <laughs> and I thought, that's very Jedi but that's not the data that I'm looking for. Um, so he asked me what I thought big data was all about, and I thought, well, big data, it's all about how, you know, we have an explosion in this unstructured data, and in this world we can map relationships between things, uh, create recommendation engines, and when you look at a company, you can map out the social network of the company and look at how companies are interacting, and that might give you hints about who's thinking about buying or acquiring somebody else. And he said to me, this is not the data you are looking for. He said that when you think about big companies and you think about the fat cats who run them, you know, whether that's the CEO, the CFO, or the legal uh, department, um, what they generally don't tend to do is like other fat cats on Facebook when they're just about to require them. What they generally tend to like is private jets. Um, fortunately, private jets have registration details, so you can work out which fat cat owns which private jet, and all the information about flight plans are public as well. So what you really want to do is look at changes that are going on with where these planes are moving, and look at disturbances, so when fat cats are meeting up. Ah, it's all about sensing a great disturbance in the flow, and, and this is the data you are looking for. Interesting. OK, so then he carried on, and we had a conversation about the, the state of the economy in the UK, the bad weather and all that sort of thing, and how he'd had that nice Mick Jagger in the back of his cab once. And then he told me the fundamental problem I had was I kept on thinking about organizations as some sort of, uh, you know, me mechanicistic sort of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of mechanism, some sort of uh, mechanical system. And in fact, organizations are nothing more than organisms. And organisms are very good at managing flow. And being a researcher, um, this naturally interests me. And so this is where I'm going to start this topic off. We're going to look at how activities in business change, and we're going to look at how practices change, and then I'm going to look at how strategy is changing, and finally, how organizations are changing. So we start with activities. Uh, many of you are probably aware of uh, Everett Rogers' work on the diffusion of innovation, how things spread from early adopters to laggards. Um, he did some wonderful work on this back in the 1960s and came up with this S-curve hypothesis. Um, but diffusion is, is, is interesting, but it just tells us how things spread, not how things evolve. So many years ago, I took a large set of data and plotted it on different axes, one of ubiquity, one of certainty, and found a new pattern. And this pattern is a pattern of how things evolve, from the innovation of something new, uh, to custom-built examples of that activity, to productization, to the introduction of rental services, to eventually that thing becoming more of a commodity and the introduction of utility services. And you can see this with computing infrastructure. So we start off with the innovation of the Z3 in 1941, and the introduction of custom-built systems like Leo, uh, the first products like the IBM 650, uh, rental services like Timshare, uh, commodity hardware, and eventually utility services such as Amazon. All activities evolve through a common pathway. And we call this process commoditization. And why does commoditization happen? Well, um, ask any businessman, and they will tell you that business is little more than warfare. It's a catfight. 
And as soon as one competitor gains some sort of advantage, some new big gun, like an e-commerce site, then everyone else will follow suit. So you have this process of commoditization driven by user and supply competition. And this is what's happening with cloud, say. We are shifting from a world where a bunch of activities are provided as products, now being provided more as utility services. And at the same time, we're seeing an explosion of innovation, of new things built on these utility services. But that's perfectly normal as well, because as activities commoditize, they become more efficient, we stop worrying about them. We start focusing on new things. And that's the process known as creative destruction, known as shump by Joseph Schumpeter. Um, but it not only enables innovation, it accelerates the process, and that's Herbert Simon's work on componentization. So what you have is a situation where an organization is, in fact, a mass of different activities, all at different stages of life cycle. And the best way of viewing this is to take that life cycle curve and plot it across the bottom, add those different stages of innovation, custom-built product and commodity, and look at frequency. And what you end up with is a profile. So you end up with activities you consume and activities you produce. And of course, every industry is different. So a mining industry is heavily towards the commodity side, where you know, a media retail industry is much more uh, towards the innovation custom-built side. So activities evolve. They're constantly changing. Organizations are nothing more than a mass of different activities. They have a profile. Everything is different. Well, not quite. If you look at those innovative activities, you can classify them as being chaotic. They have common characteristics, constantly changing, deviating from what's existed before. If you, then you have the transitional activities. These are the in-between stage, until eventually you have the more linear activities. Uh, those are the commodity ones. Um, they're characterized by being common in industry, well-defined, uh, commonly repeated, predictable, and measurable. So you have an organization, massive activities, all at these different stages. So who cares? Why does any of that matter? Well, the far left-hand side is highly uncertain. It's um, where serendipity plays a role, where it's constantly changing. And so techniques like agile development methodologies are very good there. Whereas the far right-hand side is all defined, predictable, measurable. And so techniques like Six Sigma are very good there. And if you look at any one activity like infrastructure, it's evolved across those different stages. So as activities evolve through innovation, custom-built products, more of a commodity, the practices by which we need to manage them change. And this creates what is known as the innovation paradox. Because the stuff on the left-hand side also happens to be your future source of worth, your future source of survival. Whereas the stuff on the right-hand side is all about operational efficiency and survival today. And so whenever you do one-size-fits-all methodology in an organization, you're either going to hit survival today or survival tomorrow. Six Sigma is good for one part, not the other. Agile is good for one part, not the other. And that is fundamentally the innovation paradox. So quick recap. Our organizations continuously evolve through a common life cycle driven by competition. The result of that competition is commoditization, enabling further innovation. Our organizations themselves have a profile because they're not one activity, they're a mass of activities. Those activities are evolving through those stages of chaotic transitional linear, driven by, of course, commoditization, enabling further innovation. And so activities evolve, they change from innovation custom built to more commodity, and the practices which we need to manage them have to change as well. And this is what causes the innovation paradox, i.e. the dilemma between how you survive today and survive tomorrow. Unfortunately, I wish life was so simple. Um, if you take an activity such as infrastructure, when it was in a product stage, then best practices, well, sorry, I should say novel practices about how to deal with uh, resilience, how to deal with scaling developed. And these were principally in the early days based upon having better hardware, bigger machines, M plus one. Of course, they spread and they became the best practice in the industry. And of course, infrastructure evolved. And as it evolved, it became more of a utility. And so new novel practices would appear. And those no novel practices are about distributed systems designed for failure. So 
You're solving the problems of scaling and resilience, not in hardware, but in software. And of course, those are starting to spread. They're becoming emerging in good practice, and eventually they'll end up becoming best practice for the utility world. So you have this distinction between what was best practice for the product world and what is best practice for the utility world. And one of the biggest problems with, say, cloud computing today is that people take systems which are architected to a product world on those old best practices and put it in a commodity environment. And then, of course, when Amazon has a problem, their systems go down, they all run around shouting, the end of cloud is nigh to which somebody normally says, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well? To which most people respond, not very favorably. So architectures, um, activities evolve very much from innovation, custom-built product, but also practices evolve. And they move through novel, emerging, good, and best practice stage. And of course, that's all driven by that process of commoditization, enabling more innovation. Oh, I wish things were so simple. Unfortunately, it's not a nice linear pattern. What happens is activities tend to group up behind barriers. These barriers consist of three main ones. Factors. First of all, an activity can't shift from a product to a utility world unless you have the concept suitability and the technology to do so. Secondly, customers have concerns, risks, transitional risks, disruption risks, outsourcing risks. But lastly, the biggest barrier of all is inertia barriers. Vendors who are very successful in the product world have huge inertia barriers to changing that world. It's always your past success which acts as a, 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 um, an inhibitor to your future survival. And this is why, generally, when this change happens in the industry, it's from somebody who's not in that industry. So, for example, with hosting, it was a bookseller, somebody who was not encumbered by an existing business model. And this starts a stage of disruption and war, which is then followed by a state of growth and, uh, uh, growth and building of new companies until we get to a stage of margin and peace. And this cycle is fairly continuous. And each stage of that cycle has different strategies. This is why you often hear people talk about IT today, uh, peacetime versus wartime CEO. It's just because we're shifting from one stage to another. And in this these new strategies, there's all different sorts of plays. Uh, you look at something like CRM, customer relationship management systems, very much in the product world. Uh, Salesforce shifting it to the utility service world. Now, infrastructure is actually a barrier to entry into that space. Of course, Amazon's commoditizing that. So Salesforce has recreated a new barrier of entry, which is in the platform space by buying Heroku. Of course, competitors haven't stood still. They've been differentiating with things like social CRM. So Salesforce has bought Radian 6. And this is a typical strategy known as tower and moat. So what you do is you build a tower of core value with a moat surrounding it, devoid of differential value with high barriers to entry. And the, the whole point about this is fairly simple. When your competitors wake up and realize the future isn't the past, it's this new world, they will find that there's an incumbent player who has already built a large ecosystem, who's created a, a huge tower with a moat devoid of differential value. And for most people, that's a fairly fatal position. Now, this cycle of peace and war to build also occurs on a macroeconomic scale. And they're known as Kondratiev waves. Um, and we normally refer to them in terms of ages, like the industrial age, the mechanical age. So you have the growth period uh, called eruption and frenzy. Uh, then you have this peace period of synergy and maturity, and then you have this phase of disruption and war. And that's the cycle between one age and another. So activities are evolving, they're shifting from innovation to much more of a commodity. Uh, practices, uh, you need to use different practices depending upon which stage that activity is at. But practices are evolving as well, from novel to best practice. At the same time, strategy is evolving as well. You have those different strategies of build, peace, and war. Organizations aren't like a mechanical machine at all. They're much more like an organism. And if that is the case, the question has to be asked, are organizations themselves evolving? One of the interesting things about the Kondrati of waves is that every time we go through this disruption phase, new organizations appear. These new organizations have new strategies, new practices, and they spread and become the dominant norm. 
So what happens is you're in the margin, uh, margin piece phase. You have what you would call traditional type companies. There are companies building on top of that. Uh, so they're in a growth phase. They're more creative. In the IT industry, we'd call them uh, the Web 2.0 world. And then you have that switch. You have that disruption phase, the state of war. And this is where the next phase of companies appear from. Problem is, identifying them is very difficult, because if you ask people, are you the next phase of your industry, everybody says yes. So you have to ask them first, are you more traditional, more Web 2.0? And then you have to divide those in terms of the way they act. And one of the key ways is looking at willingness to disrupt. So more traditional companies, when ranked on a scale of one to five, where they have to say what was their key focus is, disruption is right down the bottom. I mean, at the top of their list is things like profit, profitability, you know, cost control. Web 2.0 companies as well generally consider disruption not to be that important. Their main focus is on innovation. But there is a small group of Web 2.0 companies whose focus is purely on disruption. These are the next phase. They are the example, potentially, of evolution of organization. But we need evidence, and we need to prove that. And so you have to look at methodologies and ways they're acting. So you look at something like open source. Um, most traditional companies, they view open source as something which is either about cost reduction, maybe something we rely on, few of us engage in. Web 2.0 companies see it more as something we rely on, engaged with. A few talk about open source as being a weapon. This next phase of companies, this next group, are extremely biased to the right-hand side. They see open source primarily as a weapon, a tactical weapon to be deployed against others. And what do I mean by a tactical weapon? Well, if you look at something like uh, Apple and the iPhone, the iPad, uh, the iPhone isn't, for example, one activity. It's a mass of different activities, all at different stages of life cycle. And Android fundamentally is trying to commoditize those activities. Um, through creation of an open source ecosystem. And the purpose of this is purely tactical, because you force that company then into a high-risk, standalone innovation game against an ecosystem. And this is highly dangerous. I mean, many companies have been there before who've tried to lead purely through innovation. I mean, we talk about the iPad being a spectacular change to our industry. The Commodore 64 was vastly more important. But Commodore, no longer exist in their current form. So when looking at these traditional and these next wave companies, you can find differences in practices, strategies, and methodologies. So the focus, traditional, is about profit. Um, these next companies are all about disruption. Open source, it's about cost reduction. Next, it's all about being a weapon. Architectures, it's all scale up M plus one. In the next phase, it's all distributed. Learning. It's all about analyst reports, market reports. In the next phase, it's all about ecosystems. Infrastructure. Ah, the traditional is all about enterprise service. In the next phase, it's all about commodity hardware. Now, the key interesting one here is ecosystem. And the reason why ecosystem is important is because within it, there is a solution to the innovation paradox that uh, need to survive tomorrow and survive today and the polar opposite nature of those activities. And the solution that you find commonly being used is as follows. What you do is you have a profile, you take those commodity activities, and then you provide them as utility services online. You enable others then to grow, i.e. build an ecosystem around your APIs and allow others therefore to innovate. Now that those innovations are potentially a source of worth, but they are highly uncertain. So what you do is you leverage that ecosystem to identify the future innovations, successful innovations, and therefore increase your certainty. Once you've identified them, you commoditize them to core utility services, increasing efficiency, and enabling the next wave of innovation. That model, innovate, leverage, commoditize, is one that we see commonly used in cloud companies. So whether it's Amazon, or whether it's Google, or whether it's Salesforce, lots of them have approaches which are all about core utility services, building up a large ecosystem, pushing innovation out to that ecosystem, and then leveraging that ecosystem to identify the next wave. 
It's through such methods that you can create companies which seem to be highly innovative and highly efficient at the same time. And the key trick here is how you leverage that ecosystem. Now, what's important is the size of your ecosystem and how engaged you are with that ecosystem. And those two problems are problems of big data. Now, once you've got that, you still have to act upon it. You still have to execute. You still have to have the management structures in place to do something with what you found. So I'll quickly recap. If we take an approach of looking at organizations as more of an organism, and so that organism has a mass of different activities at different stages of life cycle, and each of those activities are transitioning through that chaotic transitional linear stages, driven by commoditization, which itself is enabling more innovation through creative destruction, componentization effects, then what's happening is you have a flow that's going on. You have a shift from left to right, from innovation to more commodity. And that flow is driven purely by competition. So it is always a case of situation normal, everything must change. But it's not just your activities which are changing through those different stages of innovation to commodity, but also the practices you need to deploy. And those practices in themselves are evolving from novel to best. And also the strategies are actually evolving from, or different strategies, Strategies are used at different stages, from build to peace to war. And organizations themselves are actually evolving in this process as well, driven by those larger contractive waves. And that's what's happening today. At the moment, we have a state of war in IT, and the next phase of organization is appearing, and that next phase has different approaches to both strategy, to both practices, to both activities. And the key one in that is ecosystems and the use of models like the Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize model, which enables you to create organizations which have the appearance of high rates of innovation and efficiency at the same time, and solve the innovation paradox, the need to survive tomorrow and survive today, and the need to use different practices on both sides by not focusing on innovation and efficiency, but fundamentally focusing on the flow between the two. And to do that, you need to have big data in order to leverage and leverage a large ecosystem. And we are entering a strategic phase where it's no longer companies that compete, but ecosystems. You can't look at somebody like Ubuntu and say, well, Canonical's got 700 people, therefore if I build a company with 1,000 people, we can outcompete them because they have 80,000 developers. You can't look at somebody like Amazon and say, if I have a few thousand people, I can take on Amazon Web Services because they have over 100,000 developers. So that was my learning from this taxi driver because I started off with this focus that big data was all about unstructured data, it was all about mapping, and it was all about technology. It turns out the real key about big data is all about management practices. And it's all about managing and sensing a great disturbance in the flow, fundamentally. This is the data you are looking for. Thank you. I'm, I'm always skeptical of, font, of presentations that have cats or Comic Sans in them, <laughs> but I make an exception on two fronts for Simon. Thank you very um, much, sir. So Apple recently came out with a new camera app that almost exactly mimics things yeah. like Camera Plus. Mm -hmm. um, as you subsume the innovation that's happened out there, uh, and you try to roll it back into, um, in, into something you produce internally, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that backlash? I mean, it seems like that cycle is, is pretty confrontational and you run the risk of undermining your developers. Every time Amazon uh, comes out with a new service, there's yep. some developer or some horde of developers that are resentful. So um, that is a question of how you leverage. Um, so there's two, let's deal with that in two parts. So let's take the Amazon part, first of all. Um, when you leverage an ecosystem, your choice is to copy or to acquire. Now, if you acquire companies, you strengthen the ecosystem. So the, the trick that Google played and now Salesforce is playing um, is through acquisition. And by acquiring companies, building around their services, they actually send signals out to the market to encourage more people to come on top and, and build on top of that ecosystem. The, act, the copying is a weak strategy. You can, you can get away 
with it for so long. Um, but um, the danger for Amazon is that you, know, you can't compete directly as a single company with a few thousand employees. You have to compete on an ecosystem basis. And so you've got companies like Rackspace doing open, stack, open source effort to create, and they've already got 50 odd companies involved, to create marketplaces and large ecosystems all in Amazon's market. So they're, what they're trying to do is to disrupt Amazon itself by out-commoditizing Amazon and using, in this case, open source as a, as a weapon. Um, now, when it comes to internal organization and the conflict between that as well, the flow is important. You still have to do some element of innovation. You still have to do some element of the commodity. In many cases, there isn't the commodity market existing in place. So if you're on Amazon, you have to actually build the services yourself. Um, the problem actually is um, how we organize ourselves. Because you can organize yourself along flow. So you have what are known as pioneer settlers and town planners and activities flow in your organization that way. What we tend to do is organize by type. So we organize by things like functions, such as uh, we have an IT department, a finance department, and so forth. And what you end up with there is organizations focused on this is one thing, like finance is one thing or IT is one thing, when it's clearly it's not. It's a mass of activities evolving. And you also end up with internal conflicts because you get those different types of people, some who are pioneers, some who are the town planners. And if you try to organize things in one way, they're always in conflict. And it only ever gets worse with virtual teams. So um, there's two things there. Um, there is an issue about organization. And so when you start using the ecosystem type approaches, how you actually organize yourself. So the, the, actual, the advent of data actually changes the org chart of the industry if you're doing it right. Yes. Um, one of the interesting comments earlier on, it's not about a big data, it's about right data as well. I mean, um, you have to, in this world where it is all, all about ecosystems competing, you have to start organizing your structure to cope with that type of world. Um, uh, we don't, and, uh, or generally. Uh, we don't. But the second thing uh, was about when you are actually leveraging that ecosystem, there is a major difference between whether you're acquiring or copying. Interesting. And I've seen in some cases where Google says, we would like to acquire company X. Company X says, no, I want more money. Google says, fine, we'll build it ourselves. And they've now done this several times. Mm -hmm. They can actually introduce that signal in the market to say, sure. don't ask for too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Group on, right? Yes. Um, and undermine that stuff. So I guess if you if you do the carrot and stick approach. You can have the carrot, but the fact that there could be this stick behind you allows it to be an affordable carrot. Uh, you have to game it. Every, everything in business is actually, you know, uh, one of the things about uh, big data is it does enable you to start spotting the patterns and the flow and the changes. But that is pointless unless you execute upon that. And when you're executing upon that, you've got to be thinking, where do I want to go? And how do I game the system to get there? Because organizations are not like mechanistic things which you can pull a few levers and, and it moves in that direction. Those are very 19th century type ideas about what organizations are. There are they're massive evolving activities and processes and people and you have to game that environment to get the end result. Awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Super. Uh, one more Any question questions? before we got a second or two. Did you all follow? I'm going to ask a question. Did you all we follow that? We have the house that? lights up just a little. Did you all follow that, or did I lose you? It was fast. Hmm? It was fast. Problem I always have with Simon's stuff is it makes sense, and when I walk away, I'm like, wow. It's just like watching a Steve Jobs presentation. It's that reality distortion field. But you've Thank written you. a couple of blogs on this that we'll tweet out that actually sure. explain it at your leisure. Right? In more detail. Yeah, great. And Thank uh, you. I'm here for the rest of the week, so if anybody wants to come and talk, more than welcome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very Simon. much, sir. <laughs>